Well, you just were standing and now you're seated, so you can uh, stay right there. But I'm going to be reading from, uh, from the uh, book of Luke, chapter, chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will put on for Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. And we'll stop there this morning. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for bringing us uh, together one more time. We pray for all of those who are absent today, those who are traveling. Would you please keep them safe on uh, the roads and in whatever uh, they are uh, doing? We pray for those, Lord, we have some these days who are getting old enough that the limitations of age prevent them from being here, though they would like to, and we pray for them. Pray that, uh, Lord, we will be faithful to pray for them, to minister to them as we can. We pray for those who have been in and are still ill, perhaps in the hospital, perhaps not, and uh, we ask that you will raise them up, some who are suffering, and yet they are here, and we pray for them. Lord, you know the various uh, issues that are going on, and uh, so I just, I just lift them up, um, pray that as we know about them, as we hear about them, that would be, we'd be faithful to lift them up. More than anything, Father, we always pray that, that, that the eyes of our spirit will be opened and enlightened. As much as and as important it is to have physical health, far more important to have spiritual health. And so we pray for that. As Paul prayed for the Ephesians, Father, that they would know the power of the Holy Spirit in their life, that they would have Jesus in their hearts, that they would experience the love of God in a very, very special way, and we pray for that. Lord, as we look into this word today, it will challenge us, I pray, and pray that it will help us to have your perspective on things as always. And then that we would become doers of the word and not hearers only. That's our prayer for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This, uh, this little, uh, what, what will probably end up being a three-part series, Why Not Worry? You can kind of take that little phrase a couple of different ways, right? But either one of them, I think, applies. Why Not Worry? Verses 22 through 34 in this chapter Jesus is going to deal with that subject. He could, have, he could have very well been speaking to a 21st century American audience, I think. I suspect that there are a few people who have been more stressed out in the history of the world than we are. It's just kind of our bent. We ooze anxiety. Some of us, the more, I don't know, stressed out of us, even organize it. I read... This cartoon by Charlie Brown, you all remember Charlie. Lucy came up to Charlie Brown one day and said, Charlie, are you worried about the world blowing up? Charlie Brown said, well, that all depends on, on what day is it? What, what day is it? She said, it's Tuesday. He said, well, Tuesday, I worry about personal problems. He said, Thursday is my day to worry about the world blowing up. So he had a very well-organized well categorized, and I hope you have your worries somewhat the same way. We're kind of, if we don't have something to worry about, we find something, right? Like the guy went to the psychiatrist and said, I, Doc, I, I just have this anxiety all the time. Doc says, about what? He said, about everything. So Doc says, oh, I can cure you. He, he, he hypnotized him. He erased all of the worries and anxieties from his memory and sent him on his way. A week later, the guy was back. He said, Doc, it's worse than ever. The psychiatrist said, what's, what's the problem? I thought we erased all this. He said, no, Doc, the problem now is I'm worried because I've forgotten what I'm supposed to be worrying about. <laughs> That's a little bit the way we are, right? We know there's something, something nagging in the back of our mind so much of the time. We know anxiety kills, but just can't seem to get on top of it. Someone asked uh, the late columnist Dan Landers one time, who received 10,000 letters uh, a month in her heyday, asked her, what's the subject that you most hear about, that people most write about? She said, fear. People 
write to me about fear more than anything else. Their fear of loss, that they're going to lose their job or lose their spouse or lose their position somehow in their company, lose out on the things that they have been working so hard for, lose their health. Or they have fear that they will alienate a friend or upset a neighbor or not pass the test at school or not get through the grade or not get into the college that they desire. Whatever, people have great fears. Our world is filled with fearful, anxious people, and we are not immune. You know, in studying for this, I came across uh, one statistic that was uh, staggering to me. I don't know whether it will be to you or not, but the Mayo Clinic reports that 80% of their total caseload, and remember, they're getting kind of the worst of the worst of physical ailments. They said that 80% of their total caseload is either in reality or artificially due directly to mental stress, 80%. We are, in fact, our own worst enemy, right? Mental stress. So the, the question is, how does the gospel that we have committed our lives to as Christians, how does it inform this trend to anxiety? What does it have to say about that? And I suspect that if I went around the room this morning, some of you would have you know, various verses that you would point to that you know the Bible speaks to this. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all our care upon him for he cares for us. Or Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication let your requests be made known unto God. We kind of know that the Bible speaks against this. We know it's a command, but we find ourselves as anxious as anyone else. So why? Why is it that we can't quite get on top of this? Now, I'm going I'm to give you the answer to that question right away, and then we're going to spend the next three weeks kind of, kind of unpacking that a little more, kind of looking at it in a little more detail. But here's the answer. The answer is simple. Putting it into practice is harder. The reason that we have anxiety is because we have a small God. We have a small God. A small God equates to anxiety. And we have depreciated God in the way we think about him and in the way that we incorporate him into our life. We have depreciated him to the point where we have removed our one possibility to live differently than the rest of the world, to live above circumstances, because we all face the same circumstances. It's a question of how we deal with them. We've brought God down to size, and so now when we need him, he's not there. If we don't have a big God, beloved, in the big times, we will not have a big God in the tough times. I'm so thankful. One of, the, one of the great things, and I, I, I can think of a couple of the visits that I made this week where people going through tough times had such faith in God. They were more of an inspiration to me than the other way around. And I hope that will be true of us, but when it's not, there will be anxiety. George Mueller, the great man of faith that built all these or orphanages in London in the late 1800s, we've all heard so much about him, how he used to just, by faith, pray food onto the table literally sometimes. He said this one time. He said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. That's a really true statement and a good way to look at this, isn't it? It's another way of saying this would be to say, when anxiety walks in the door, faith walks out. Or vice versa. When faith walks in the door, Anxiety walks out. The two simply can't coexist. Worry, anxiety, fear, when these are beginning to plague us and they are running us. It's not that we never have these, of course, but when they drive our existence, it's a huge red flag that faith is absent. Can't live by faith. 
and still have all this anxiety going on at the same time. Worry depreciates God. Worry cuts God down to size. Now, obviously, we can't, we can't actually take away from or add anything to God, right? We, as his created beings, have no ability to diminish him or to increase him. But what we can do and what we do do is diminish God in our own life, right? We can do that. We can cut him down to size as far as we are concerned. We can render him ineffective in our life by unbelief, by lack of faith, by believing this problem is too big for him, by not believing that perhaps he's allowed this for some reason, by not putting our faith in God. Worry makes us big. It makes us the center of the universe. It makes our interests and agenda the big thing as opposed to God's. Worry makes us big and it makes God small. Worry inflates the wrong thing. Faith makes God big. Worry makes us big. That's what this message and this passage is going to be all about. Jesus has been talking about money. He's been talking about materialism and our attitudes toward those. And this section is kind of a continuation, really, of the same message that he's been preaching, only now he's changed the subject slightly. Rather than targeting the attitude that always wants, materialism, money, wealth, and so on, now he's targeting the attitude that always fears. And always thinks, oh, the sky is falling. My world is about to come apart. He's going to target that. And what he's saying is that worry should not be part of our existence as a believer in God. It's just inconsistent with who we are as a follower of Christ. Faith builds God up in our eyes. Worry diminishes him. So in this passage, I'm gonna, the, the outline we're going to follow is to look at seven ways, seven ways that worry diminishes God. Seven ways that we allow God to be diminished in our life by lack of faith and by too much attention to worry, by putting the attention on us instead of God. The sin, because it is a sin, of worry begins to occupy us. So we're going to take the first two today. But, you know, you, over the next week or two, you might want to study through this passage, see if you can find the next five. What are the ways in which we depreciate God that we can see in this passage that bring worry and fear and anxiety to the top in our life? And I hasten to add again, there will be times when we have these. They will come. The issue isn't will they come. The issue is how do we deal with them when they, when they do come. First way that worry depreciates God, that, God, that it makes God small in our life is worry destroys God's peace. Worry destroys the peace of God. That makes sense, doesn't it? Worry and peace are essentially the opposite ends of the spectrum. And if you've got worry, you're not going to have peace. If you have peace, you're not going to have worry. Verse 22, he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now the first thing you should notice about that verse is that He's not saying, listen, don't, don't be anxious about the luxuries of life that you don't have. He's not saying that. He's saying, don't be anxious about the very most basic things of life. And if he doesn't want us to worry about the most basic things of life, it's pretty obvious we shouldn't be worrying about the luxuries of life, right? Don't worry about food and clothing. It doesn't get much more basic than that. Pretty much eliminates anything else from the worry list if you can get to that point. Now, a second thing to notice is he doesn't say, he doesn't say, don't do anything about the necessities of life. He's not saying, listen, don't worry about food and clothing. I'll take care of it. I'm your sugar daddy. You can just sit back and rest and relax and I'll take care of it. 
Not saying that either. We know how the Apostle Paul made a point when he was talking to the, some, of the, some of the epistles he wrote, particularly to the Thessalonians, how he would finance his missionary work, even though he had every right to ask for support, he would finance some of his missionary work by doing tent making. Remember that? And he made a point of this in 2 Thessalonians 3, and verse 10, where he says, for even when we were with you, we would give you we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So working for our daily bread is part of the exercise. It's part of what we should be doing as Christians. Jesus is not here encouraging an attitude of laziness or irresponsibility. But what he's commanding, what he's commanding is an attitude that's, that's, this, that he's, he's commanding us not to have an attitude that's worried about, is there going to be enough for tomorrow, for next week, for next month, for retirement? That that attitude drives us. He's commanding us not to have that. He's saying, don't, don't get uptight, not even about the basics. Go to work, do your job, do the best you can to supply but you begin to think about and be interested in the things that interest me and I'll take care of these other things. I'll make sure that you're covered. That's what he's saying in this passage. Now, remember in the previous sections, he's, he's urged them, we should lay up some treasure in heaven. And he's realizing that as they do that, as they begin to give, maybe even more than they think they have to give, they're liable to get to the point where they're saying, wow, if I start to lay up treasure in heaven, I may not have enough for here and now. And Jesus is saying, no, no, don't go there. Don't worry about that. You go do what you can to meet the need. You give as I have asked you to do. Don't worry about that. Leave the worry to me. Kind of reminds me of that old, was it Greyhound commercial? I think they said, leave the driving to us. That's what Jesus is saying here. Leave the worry to me to me, even about the basics of life. I have ways you don't even know about. God has creativity, beloved, that's amazing. Verse 29 extends this thought. He says, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Don't go there. It's like a repetition of what he's just said in verse 22. In verse 30, he tells us what we are to seek. He says, instead, seek his kingdom. Seek his kingdom. So once again, we're back to this question. Well, is, is, is what Jesus, when he says, don't seek what you're to eat, but seek his kingdom, is he advising us against working for food? And of course, again, the answer is no, he's not doing that. He's using hyperbole. He's using exaggerated speech, Right? To make the point, how do we know that? Well, because the parallel passage to this is found in Matthew, don't turn there, it's a verse you'll know, but Matthew 6.33, right? Where he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things that you worry about, your food, your clothing and all that stuff, that, that'll be added unto you. But seek him first. It's not a question of either or, it's a question of priority. It's not a question of quit my job, but it's a question of where do I spend my time worrying? What am I thinking about first? And he's saying, listen, first priority, my kingdom. First priority, making sure that you're obeying the calling that I have on your life, whether, you're, whether your occupation happens to be in a secular or sacred field as far as we're concerned. I have a purpose for you. Make sure that's at the top of the list. All these other things will get added. You'll be amazed. Seek first my kingdom. We get a little more help when we kind of look at the word anxious that shows up in those two verses in verse 22 and 29. Don't be anxious. It's the, it's the, Greek, the Greek word is merimnao, and it, the, the, the core, the root word is meris, meris, and it means to divide. It means to draw apart in different directions. 
it, it sort of means to get distracted because you're looking here, then you're looking there, and then you're looking somewhere else. He said, that's what's liable to happen to you. When you're worrying, that's what's happening. Your, your eye is off, to, your eye's been taken off the main goal. Your eye's taken off God. And your eyes are everywhere else. What am I going to eat? What am I going to do? How am I going to, well, I'm going to fix the car. How am I going to, what, how am I, how am I going to handle these things? And he's saying, listen, I know that's an issue, but you, get your focus on Jesus first. Make sure your priorities are right. It's, it, it, his, his point here is the same one that's illustrated in the life of Peter. When Jesus is walking on the water one night coming toward them, remember, Peter says, hey, can I get out and walk? Jesus says, sure, come on. And Peter gets out and starts walking, right? And as long as he's looking at Christ, everything's good. As soon as he starts looking at the waves, what happens? He's sinking fast. Why? Because he got distracted. He became, his attention became divided. And the question became, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust Jesus who's out there or am, or am I going to trust my common sense that tells me people don't walk on water? Jesus is saying, trust me. I do things that people can't do. I provide in ways that people can't provide. Trust me. Make sure I'm first. Anxiety quickly destroys the peace of God in our lives. It gets us focused in multiple directions. It fractures us, come apart. Sometimes you just kind of have to ask yourself, what if it all fell apart? Would God still be on the throne? Some of us feel like it fell apart this week, probably with the Supreme Court ruling, right? Is God still on the throne? I hadn't changed. God is still there. God is still in charge. Stuart Briscoe is a pastor. He talked about going to preach at a drafty old London church one time. He lived in England at the time. And he said, a fellow met him there, and, and he was just one of those guys. You know, nothing was, nothing was right. So the guy began to throw, show him through the church before he's going to preach on that Sunday morning, but he's telling him all the things that are wrong. They needed new carpet. Didn't have any money for it. The organ, you know, wasn't working, but they didn't have any money to get it fixed. Pastor was, you know, really not a very good pastor. Choir master had just been fired. Finances were in dire straits. They were having problems with vandalism. I mean, the list went on. And in his, in his biography, here's what, what, uh, what Briscoe says. He says, after about half an hour, he seemed to be running out of material. So I ask, tell me about the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell me about Jesus. So the guy looked like he'd been kicked in the shins and said, well, we better move on. What was he trying to say to him? He was trying to say to him, your attention's in the wrong place. You want to see perfection? Look at Jesus. You want to see the answer to whatever the problem may be? Look at Jesus. You're looking at the problems. You're looking at the circumstances. Your attention is all distracted. It's all in the wrong place. Looking to Jesus, Hebrews tells us, the author and finisher of our salvation. Something we have to practice, beloved. It doesn't come naturally. It comes naturally. I mean, if, if you're a planner like me, if you are a kind of a, uh, you know, be prepared for the worst kind of person like me, you're always thinking about the circumstances. You're always wondering, what can I do to offset this? And it's hard to get our attention focused on the Lord. Look to Jesus. Because anxiety destroys God's peace and thus diminishes, minimizes God in our life. Second way that anxiety diminishes God, it defies God's perspective. Verse 23, it defies God's perspective. Verse 23, for life is more than food and the body is more than clothing, more than clothing. If there's, a, if there's kind of a key verse or an overriding principle in this passage, I think this is it. This is a universal truth. This is universal truth. Life is, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. But here's the problem. We do not naturally perceive that 
truth. Not at all. To us, life is food, meaning all the material things that it takes to keep life going, that's where our attention goes. That's what seems most important to me. We're born with a predisposition that survival physically is the most important thing there is. That's our predisposition. That's, if we didn't do anything naturally, that's where we would go. And this verse is counter to that. This is God letting us in on something we wouldn't know otherwise, which is there is something more important than our physical existence. There's something more important than food. There's something more important than clothing. There's something more important than survival. And that, that takes a radical realignment to get our arms around it. Do you, do you see that? I mean, that, that we, in, fa in fact, not only does it take a radical realignment to get our arms around that, we wouldn't even know that. If somebody higher than us, someone transcendent, the God we sang about in such beauty this morning, if he hadn't come and told us this, we wouldn't know this. It's a simple verse, but it's a truth we would have no way from our physical existence to figure out. And so God in his grace has come and informed us, guess what? Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. That's God's giving us insight into reality. Reality to us is our physical existence and God has to tell us, no, there's way more that you're not seeing. And I know you wouldn't know it if I didn't tell you. That's why I'm coming to tell you. So when you live as though survival is the highest good, and the body is clothing, and the, uh, 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 the life is, is, is uh, food, and the body is clothing, then you are defying God's perspective. It's not all about me and about here and now. If it is, then I have every right to worry. Now, please note a couple things. Jesus does not say life is not food. Look at the verse again. He doesn't say life is not food. He doesn't deny nor diminish our physical existence. Eastern religion says of physical existence, ignore it. It's not real anyway. Got pain? Ignore it. It's not real. Your whole goal in life is to get beyond consciousness, really, because it's not real. It denies the physical existence. Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say life is not food. He says life is more than food. Yes, life is real. Food is real, but it's not all. Life is food, but that's not all that it is. In fact, it's, that's not even the most important thing in life. In fact, it pales by comparison to your eternal existence and the reality that lies there. As important as it is to you right now, in the big scheme of things, it takes a huge back seat. So Jesus is teaching us that what we can see with our senses is only a small part of what is real. And if we're going to get God's perspective on things, we have to live in light of the fact that there's more than just what we see, touch, feel, taste, and smell. We have to live beyond that reality. We have to look to eternal realities. When we get anxious about food and about the clothing as though they were the most important things in our existence. We are in denial of God's perspective. Whenever we're in denial of God's perspective, we're living in unreality. And you can remember, you remember what it is when you live in unreality, what are you? Insane, right? That's how we live. Out of touch. Now, why is life more than food? And here's the answer to that question. It's because death is not the end. Life is more than food because death is not the end. If death was the end, life would be food. 
Life would be survival. Life would be clothing and medical attention and anything else you can do to keep it going. And while all those are important, they're not the most important. When I worry about food and clothing, I shortchange my existence. And I won't necessarily see the impact now, although in some ways I will, but 100 years from now, I will know the impact very, very, very personally, right? I will have shortchanged my existence if I live as though life is only food. I'll be like, if you were here last week, you remember we talked about the rich man in verses 16 through 20, and I'll be just like him. The guy that you remember was laying up, he had all this stuff that he'd been laying up for 60 years and now he's gonna retire and he has more than he knows what to do with so he's building new barns so he can lay it all up. And God looks at him and he says, you fool. Why was he a fool? Was he a fool because he gathered things for his, for his physical existence? No. He was a fool because he didn't gather anything for his eternal existence. He was a fool because he saw his physical existence as only in terms of himself and not in terms of God and not in terms of others. Therefore, he was a fool. If life is only physical, he wouldn't have been exactly a fool. He just wouldn't have been able to enjoy all that he had laid up all that time because his life was required earlier than he anticipated. If there were no hereafter, no life after death, no judgment, no accountability, if I wasn't going to answer to God one day soon, if none of those things were true, then this man would have hardly been a fool. His his foolishness, beloved, his foolishness was dictated by the fact that life is more than food and the body is more than clothing and he had made provision only for food and clothing. He didn't think beyond that. Now his soul is required and he's made absolutely no preparation. Things end and people don't, right? Things end, but people don't. Therefore, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. That's God's eternally revealed perspective. Our perspective is, is way too small, you know? I tried to think of ways to illustrate this. I didn't come up with a very good one, but suppose, suppose that you were confined all of your life to, your, to the house you live in. Maybe it's a little more exotic. You've got a place where you can actually grow food. So you have a kind of a greenhouse out there somewhere. And, it, and over time, it's kind of a, you make kind of a comfortable existence for yourself there, but you never go anywhere outside the house. You're just confined to that one existence and you worry we're gonna get enough light to grow the food this year or not. You know, where are we gonna get, how are we gonna generate water? You, you, know, you have these worries that are going on, but you live pretty comfortably in that little house and after a while you kind of got most of that figured out and, and, your, and your existence is, is kind of good until one day after you've been there for decades, somebody comes along and opens the front door that you didn't even know was there and you look out and there's a whole new world out there that you never knew existed. That's what Jesus is trying to do here. He's trying to open our eyes to the fact that outside of our front door, there's an eternity. There's a whole other world. There's a whole other place that's real and that we were made for and that we will one day exist in in some way, shape, or form. So he's saying, you're living in this little room as though this room was all there is and it's not true. There's far more. So life is not just food or clothing. It's a, it's a, it's a view of reality we'd have never had if someone had never come along and shown us. But Jesus has come along and shown us. And God has made sure that Jesus' words got written down in his Bible. And so you got here today so that you could hear this explained. And so now you have no way to go away and say, I don't know this. 
God's revealed it to you. Now the only question is, are you, are you and me and all the rest, are we going to live in God's reality or are we going to live in our own? Arthur Rubinstein, you know, the great Polish, great Polish pianist. He must have been a character from the little bit I've read about him, but he came to the U.S., became a U.S. citizen in 1946. The war, obviously, had an impact on that. And he, but he got frustrated with the bureaucracy here, just like he did where he came from, and he arrived late to a lunch with the writer named Clifton Fadiman one day, and Fadiman recorded this. He said Rubenstein got there, he entered late, he ordered his meal, and then he apologized. And Fadiman quotes him this way, he said, sorry to be so late, for two hours I have been at my lawyers making a testament, a will. He said, what a nuisance, one figures, one schemes, one arranges, and in the end, what? It is practically impossible to leave anything for yourself. <laughs> what? Practically impossible to leave anything for yourself. That was a man who was suffering because he was living in defiance of God's perspective of reality, right? You can't leave anything for yourself. That's the whole point. But you will go on. You will continue. Your existence will not end. Death is not the end. How much better if he could have only seen it's not about trying to save it for here, it's about sending it on ahead and laying up treasure in heaven as the Lord had instructed us before. Now, you know, you always run into the question, well, how do we, how do we send it on ahead? How do we send it on ahead? And there are obviously multiple ways to do that. Our giving of money is a way to send it on ahead if it's done with the right attitude. If it's, if it's done grudgingly, you might as well keep it. But if it's done with an eye toward loving God and seeing his work done and so on or helping others, it's a way to send it on ahead and turn it into something that's eternal. How does that happen? I don't know. God only knows, but he tells us that's true. That's not the only way. I love the example that David Platt gave. Some of you have read Radical. Some of you will read it this fall in a small group. I trust, I hope. I hope, hope that you'll sign up. But in, in the book Radical, he tells the story of a young man named Daniel. Daniel went to school and took up mechanical engineering. He was a very talented student. He graduated with honors. And he was recruited by several companies, one of which was a nuclear power plant that was close to where he lived in Birmingham, and they were willing to give him a job, give him great pay for a starting job, and they were willing to pay for him to go on and take a master's degree and even a PhD if he wanted to do that. But Daniel had become a follower of Christ about two years before this, while he was in college. And as he thought this over and as he prayed about it, he felt that God didn't want him to take that particular job. He was learning how to deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow Jesus. And so he signed on with a company that was, they could use his engineering skills that were taking engineering talent around the world to try and solve some of the problems in the impoverished communities around the world in the name of Christ. His father Daniel's father emailed David Platt, who pastored that church in Birmingham, afterwards, and he said this. He said, Daniel has made a very radical departure from my long-held and traditional value system. I have raised my children with solid Christian values and naturally have expected them to grab the brass ring of opportunity and settle into a productive family Life, he had it all figured out where his kids should go. And there would have been nothing wrong with that. But the Lord apparently had other plans for Daniel, and Daniel was trying to follow Christ. He the, the dad went on then to explain how much he felt he had learned from his son as he watched his son go through this, this process and how proud he now was of him that he was taking the talents and the skills that he had learned in school and taking the gospel to other places and to other people that would have been unknown to him and where the gospel would not have been known if he hadn't done this. 
You see, Daniel was now living in God's reality that life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Platt, in, his, in the book, goes on and tells about seeing Daniel later on, finding out all, getting a report from him of all the unprecedented opportunity was, that God was giving him in America, in Africa, and in Asia to pursue, quote, a much greater dream than he'd ever had before. You know what happened? Daniel, Daniel had opened the front door. And he found out that in God's reality, there's a lot of adventure. There's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be gained. There's a lot to be enjoyed. There's a lot of heartache and there's a lot of problems out there to be addressed. And God was giving him the privilege to be part of that. So instead of living within his own limited human perspective, he's living in God's reality. He's trusting God. Because if life is only food and the body is only clothing, he's wasting his time, right? He might as well be saving his money and spending it for his own pleasure. But if what God tells us is true, if God's reality is the real reality, then he's wasting nothing. Let me ask the question to us this morning. Have you been outside lately? You've been outside the limits of your own human perspective. Have, you know, this is, what's this going to, is this going to mean something different for each one of us? I can't tell you what it means for you. I'm working hard enough to try and figure out what it means for me to live in God's reality instead of my own. God has to keep, you know, I keep getting out the front door a little ways and then coming back and God has to kick me out again, but I'm working at it. I think my heart's in the right direction. I hope yours is. What does it look like to live in God's reality? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? That's what we need to be asking. Defying God's reality will bring anxiety. That I know. Living in God's reality will bring peace of heart and mind. It's the only way to live, really. You know, if you think about it, the greatest example of this is who? Jesus Christ, right? If Jesus had lived as though life is food and the body is clothing, he never would have gone to the cross, right? He never would have given up his life. In fact, he would have done everything he could to save his life. He would have been demonstrating that, that life and survival is the highest good, and that physical life is our most precious possession. That's what he would have done if that was true. The very fact that he went to the cross was demonstrating that life is more than food. He was demonstrating that he was willing to go because he could there pay the penalty for the price of all of our sin to bring an end to the guilt, to even the power of sin in our life, to the anxiety that so takes us over and give us eternal life in Christ. Do you have that? I mean, do you, do you know that you have that? You accepted the gift. If you were to go to New Orleans today, to the Superdome, there's a statue outside. The name of the statue is Rebirth, Rebirth. And what you would see there is a statue of a football player named Steve Gleason. And what he's doing in the statue is he's blocking a punt. The background to that is, of course, that he played football as a linebacker for the New Orleans Saints. Hurricane Katrina blew through town and destroyed everything in the downtown area of New Orleans. And so they were without a place to play football for at least a year. 21 months after this all happened, they had their first game back finally in the New Orleans Superdome in 2006. And in that game, early in the season, in the first quarter, Steve Gleason broke through the line he blocked a punt that was, that was covered in the end zone for a touchdown, and it was the first score the New Orleans Saints made that year, and it started them on the, on, on the way to the best season they'd ever had in their history up until that time. He became part of New Orleans Saint lore because of that blocked punt. He retired in 2008, just prior to New Orleans winning the Super Bowl in 2009, but they did vote him a ring at the end of the day, primarily because in 2011, he, be, he was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. He's been on TV a few times in New Orleans games. Some of you may have seen him. 
I happened to see a game one night where he was interviewed by Peter King, the writer. King boldly asked the obvious question. Said to, said to Gleason, who was showing some of the effects, but he wasn't totally disabled at that time. He said, have you thought to yourself, how long do I have to live? You thought to yourself, how long do you have to live? Here's how Gleason answered. He said, yeah. He said, which is really a good thing to think as a human. And King responded, why? Here's what Gleason said. Listen to this. He said, because we all have a timeline, Peter. Most of us don't live like we have a timeline. But we all have a timeline. We all have a timeline. None of us know how long the timeline is, but we all have one. See, there's an end out there somewhere. Maybe soon, it may be long, we don't know. But what we do know is, given that, wouldn't it be wise to live as though there's a timeline? Because life is not just food, and the body is not just clothing. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you for this reminder. We'll have a timeline. We don't know how long ours is. Just know that there is one. We won't be the first one to get out alive. But Lord, the important thing, I guess, is that beyond that timeline, there's more. The timeline only relates to our physical existence in the here and now. We don't, we don't stop existing at that point. There's more. And the clear teaching of your word, all the revelation you've given us, all the comments that Jesus ever made, leads us to know that what we do now has consequences in who and what we are later. So we want to be wise. We don't want to live in defiance of your perspective, but rather in line with your perspective. Lord, that'll ease a lot of the anxiety in our life when we come to the realization that, hey, whatever happens now, something much more important coming later. Help us to keep that in mind. Help us to live in light of that. Help us to line up with your reality and not just ours. Pray that for the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.